Okay, so let's start. Um, if you saw my post on Piazza, then you then you saw that what confused me, what I thought was a gap in Docarmo was not, because I was making things unnecessarily complicated. Let me re remind you what the definitions were and what we ended with last time. So if I have a piecewise smooth curve on my manifold, um, then a variation of alpha is basically a one parameter family of smooth curves with the same domain zero to A. This one parameter family is continuous. So it's continuous in T and in S. Um, when S is zero, you get alpha. And it has the property that there's only a finite number of places where the velocities of these curves for fixed S can jump. And they don't have to jump at all these things, but, but any of them for any S can only jump at these, these endpoints, okay? Uh, and, and what does that mean? That means that if you restrict sigma to uh, minus epsilon epsilon cross the closed bounded interval TK minus one to DK, it's smooth, okay? And we say that this variation is proper if it has fixed endpoints. In other words, if T equals zero, then for any S, it's always alpha of zero. And uh, if T equals A, then for any S, it's always alpha of A. I'll draw a picture in a second. Uh, let me draw the picture now. Okay? So here's, this is alpha. Um, here's a smooth variation. Uh, this, this, this alpha is, 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 uh, is smooth. So here's a, a picture of this variation. Each of these orange curves is sigma s, which is sigma s dot for some fixed value of s. Okay, so it's a it's a smoothly varying family of a piecewise smooth curves from uh, t equals zero to t equals a. And if it's a and if it's a proper variation, all these orange curves start and end at the endpoints of alpha. Okay, and given given a variation, we define the variational vector field of sigma to be, um, you, you look at the, you fix T and you think of it as a curve in S, that's a smooth curve in S, and you take D by DS at S equals zero. So the velocity vector of these transverse curves. So these blue curves here are uh, the transversal curves. So this is sigma dot T for some fixed T. And when you take D by DS at S equals zero of these curves, this will be V at time T, okay? So I, uh, I um, incorrectly said that V could have jumped this continuity. It can't, right? V is, is piecewise smooth. It's continuous everywhere on, on zero A. And, uh, and the, uh, it's on, on each of these TK minus one to TK, it's smooth. It's the restriction of something smooth on some, um, some larger open interval, but it's continuous. It doesn't have any jumps. And then the last thing we did on Monday was we showed that given any piecewise smooth vector field along gamma, you can find a, a variation of alpha, sorry, along alpha. You can find a variation of alpha for which this is the variation vector field. And we're not saying it's unique, it's not unique, but the, this is the sort of canonical way to do it. So you take, you take this vector field and you multiply by S and you take the exponential map. I had to, use the compactness of the image of alpha to get and totally normal neighborhoods to make sure that I can get uh, um, that this thing would be defined uniformly uh, for any T on the same minus epsilon to epsilon in S. So that's a variation which induces this vector field B. And uh, if, if this vector field, this red vector field vanishes at the two endpoints, then the variation you get is proper, which is easy to see because that, at the endpoints, if this vector field is zero, you're taking the exponential map, applying it. Sorry, this is this is alpha of t. Didn't make sense otherwise. V of t is in alpha of t. So at uh, t equals zero or t equals a, you get the zero vector. So you'll get x of alpha of zero or x of alpha of a, and it'll it'll be a proper variation. Okay. So what the goal is for today, or and and then I define the length and energy, which I'll I'll do again. The goal today is to, um, to uh, look at the first and second variation formulas for the energy functional. So given a variation of a curve, we get uh, the length of each of those sigma s's in that family. That's a function of s. 
or we can also get the energy that's a function of s and we can look at the derivative of that function of s uh, and that gives us the first variation formula and then the second derivative gives us the second variation formula so the the goal of the first part is to show that um if you have if if alpha let, let me write it down so, so we're going to characterize geodesics as critical points of the energy functional. And then at critical points, usually you only look at the second derivative of a functional at a critical point. So at a critical point, in other words, at a geodesic, we're going to compute the second variation of the energy, the second derivative. And this is going to give us a formula that's going to have a lot of applications to proving global topological results about Riemannian manifolds. Uh, small typo. Yep. You say V is a piecewise. Um... Smooth vector field along gamma. I think it should be alpha. Yes. Where did I write it? Along alpha. Yep. Yeah, I usually use alpha for an arbitrary curve and gamma for a geodesic. Okay. Um, okay. So we had, so given let sigma be a variation of alpha, define L. From minus epsilon epsilon to to the reals non-negative reals and e this is the length function of the variation and this is the energy function of the variation And it's exactly what it should be. L of S is the length of sigma S. So it's the integral from zero to A of d sigma dt, absolute uh, norm dt. And E of S is the energy of sigma of S. And what's the energy? It's one half the integral of the square of the speed. As I said, Docarmo doesn't put the one half here. Everyone else does. Uh, I'm going to put it in there. So the first thing to observe, so by the way, you can do this more generally, right? I fixed a variation of the curve alpha. You can just say, given a curve, uh, you can define a functional on the space of all curves on M, all piecewise smooth curves, right? Which is if you feed it a piecewise smooth curve, it spits out the energy or the length or the energy. So these are both functionals on the space of all piecewise smooth curves on M. Um, but we're not going to talk about what does it mean to look at the space of all piecewise smooth curves. You can make sense of that as an infinite dimensional smooth manifold. Uh, we don't need to do that. And so we're going to keep things simple and just fix a variation and look at these as functions of S, right? These are the lengths and energies of this fixed variation. Okay, so uh, here's, a, here's a fact. So recall, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality will tell us that if we integrate f times g from zero to a, these are just functions of t, that's gonna be less than or equal to the integral from zero to a of f squared dt times the integral from zero to a g squared dt with equality, these are continuous functions or, or yeah, continuous functions with equality if and only if f is some lambda g, or lambda is a, a real number, right? That's just because the space c0 of 0a, the continuous functions on this closed bounded interval 0a, is, um, is an inner product space with this inner product. Um, so let's apply this. Take f is um, alpha prime of t, the velocity of some curve alpha, and take g to be one. If I do that here, what do I get? I get uh, g is one. This is the length of alpha squared. So I get the length of alpha squared is less than or equal to, if g is one, this is just a. And if f is the velocity of alpha, this is, this is twice the energy. So I get twice, two times a times the energy of alpha. Okay, so the length, the square of the length is always less than or equal to two times a times the energy of alpha with equality if and only if d alpha dt is some positive constant because it has to be a constant 
times g, and g is one, but f is is non-negative, right? So it has to be, um, well, I guess it has to be a non-negative constant. But if 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 uh, if d alpha dt is zero, then this is a constant curve, right? So we're let's exclude the constant curve here. Um, so so the length squared is always bounded by two times a times the energy, and you get equality exactly when alpha is constant speed parameterization. So if alpha is constant speed parameterization, then the length squared is just 2a times the energy. So if you're restricting yourselves, for example, to unit speed curves or just to constant speed curves, then uh, one, one of these functions up to a positive constant is the square of the other. So if you want to minimize L or E, it's equivalent, right? Just like when we teach in calculus one that minimizing the square of something is the same as minimizing the thing itself if it's, if it's positive. Okay. So. The first thing we're going to do is the first variation formula. Following proposition, I'm going to call it uh, V1 for first variation. This is the first variation formula for energy. So the, the setup is as before, we have alpha is a piecewise smooth curve. Sigma is a variation. We're not assuming proper, need not be proper. Um, that's right, need not be proper. Um, and let E be the energy function, the energy of this variation. Then um, the first variation formula is a formula for the derivative of E at S equals zero. So it's equal to minus integral from zero to A V of T inner product DT alpha prime DT minus the sum from k equals one up to n minus one v at tk alpha prime tk plus minus alpha prime tk minus minus the inner product of v of zero with alpha prime of zero plus the inner product of v of a with alpha prime of a so recall the, the, the alpha is piecewise smooth and it can have the jump discontinuities in the velocity at the TKs. So alpha prime doesn't have to be continuous. This is the, this is the left, this is the limit of alpha prime coming from the, from the right. And this is coming from the left. This is, this is the jump in the velocity alpha prime. So if alpha was smooth, there's no jumps in alpha prime, this term would be gone. And if the variation was proper, then V of zero and V of A would be zero. So these terms would be gone, right? So if you have a smooth variation, if you have a smooth curve and a proper variation, you only get this first term. Okay. So let's prove this. We're gonna use the symmetry lemma and we're gonna integrate by parts. Almost everything in differential geometry involves integration by parts. So here's the proof. Let's write down the energy as a function of S. This is one half zero to A d sigma T d sigma T inner product. That's the norm squared, right? And I can write this because, uh, because of the uh, piecewise smooth nature of the variation. I can write this as the sum from K equals one up to N one half tk minus one to tk. I mean, I didn't, I didn't do anything yet here. I just said that the integral 
from zero to a is the same as the sum of these integrals over all these subintervals. Um, but the reason I'm doing that is because now when I'm restricting to this interval, sigma is smooth here, right? It's the restriction of something smooth. So let's look at each one of these integrals. Um, so differentiating under the integral sign and using the symmetry lemma, remember the, the symmetry lemma was defined on for, for parametrized surfaces, right? The sigma is a, is a parametrized, a variation is a parametrized, parametrized surface. So I have d by ds of one half tk minus one to tk d sigma dt, d sigma dt, dt. I can bring the d by ds inside and I'm going to get, when I differentiate this and use metric compatibility, I'm going to get two times ds d sigma dt, d sigma dt. Now the twos are going to cancel. And here I can use the symmetry lemma. I can swap the T and the S. So this is the integral from TK minus one to TK of uh, DT of D sigma DS, D sigma DT. And now, now that I've swapped the uh, I've used the symmetry lemma to change an S derivative to a T derivative. I'm going to integrate by parts. I'm going to write this as equal to TK minus one to TK. I'm going to rewrite this, this integrand as um, D by DT of D sigma ds d sigma dt again by metric compatibility the, the difference there is d sigma dt uh, ds dt of d sigma dt right because if you expand this first guy the first thing you get is what i had and the next thing you get is cancelled off by this um, and then i can use the fundamental theorem of calculus on the first term to write this as d sigma ds inner product d sigma dt from tk to tk minus one minus the integral tk minus one to tk d sigma ds dt d sigma dt. Okay, so that's uh, that's this that that's the s derivative of this thing. And I want the S derivative of E. So I just sum all the S derivatives. This differentiation is linear. So we get that E prime S is uh, the sum from K equals one up to N, D sigma DS, D sigma DT at TK minus one to TK minus, and now again, I can just make this an integral from zero to A of, d sigma ds and then dt d sigma dt and this is great because i'm going to want this expression in about half an hour and it ended up on the right hand side of the board coincidentally so i'm going to leave it there for a while this is the derivative at any time s the s derivative now we just set s equal to zero And let's see what's going to happen. Um, when I set s equal to zero, remember sigma at s equals zero is just alpha because sigma is a variation of alpha. And d sigma ds at s equals zero is v, is the definition of the variation vector field. So we plug in s equals zero, we get sigma of zero t is alpha. And d sigma ds at zero t is v of t. So we have e prime at zero is um, 
is going to be the sum from k equals one up to n v of t k and v of t um, alpha prime of t t k minus one to t k minus the integral from zero to a. Um, yeah, so D, I should have written this as well, right? D, D sigma dt at zero t is just alpha prime of t. Um, because I'm taking d by dt, so I can, I can pl plug in s equals zero to begin with. And then this is going to be v, and then this is going to be dt of alpha prime. v of t uh, dt alpha prime. I guess I don't have to put the t here, dt. So we're here. And now I claim that this is exactly what we have here. I mean, this is the same thing. Let me put the t, it doesn't matter. So that's the, that's the first term here. And then uh, what happens here, the last one, this is a capital N, t capital N is A. So I'll have a V of A with alpha prime of A is there. The first one is zero. So that's gonna come with a minus sign. And then all the other ones, let's see. I'm gonna go from one to N minus one. I'm gonna have um, at the upper limit, it's gonna be coming in from the left. So, so the positive sign is gonna be with the left hand um, alpha prime and the, and the negative sign is gonna be with the positive sign. So this is equal to this, right? which is what we, what we wanted to show. Okay, so there's our first variation formula. Let's look at the consequences of this. Corollary um, alpha is a geodesic. So alpha is a piecewise smooth curve. Alpha is a geodesic if and only if for every proper variation sigma of alpha, we have alpha prime, uh, E prime at the origin is zero. So IE geodesics are critical points for energy with respect to proper variations. That's what this corollary says. So let's see how this follows from the first variation formula. Okay. So first, suppose that, uh, that alpha was a geod geodesic. We know that geodesics are regular, they're smooth, right? They have no jumps. If alpha is a geodesic, then, um, alpha prime tk plus equals alpha prime tk minus. I mean, there is no subdivision, right? Alpha is smooth. Um, and so if sigma is a proper variation, oh, uh, and it, this is true, and dt alpha prime is zero. That's the geodesic equation, says the velocity, the acceleration of alpha is zero. So if sigma is a proper variation, we get that E prime of zero equals zero from the first variation formula, which is here. Because it's smooth, so all this term is gone. It's proper, so this term is gone. And it's a geodesic, so that term is gone, all three of them. Uh, so the non-trivial yep. comment. So you, yep. you've been trying to avoid, you know, regarding the space of all these uh, variations as a, an infinite yep. dimensional manifold. But when you say it's a critical point, you really, well, yeah, it's yeah, so, where, yeah, you know, it's in that infinite dimensional that's right. manifold. That's why, I, that's right. That's why I put this sort of as a parenthetical remark. This is not a rigorous statement here, right? I'm saying if you do know more about the calculus of variations, then that's what this is saying, right? 
this is the this is the precise statement. Right. So yes, if you if you want to talk more, and you know, this was a whole course on calculus of variations, we can make everything nice and rigorous, but I don't want to do that. And so this you should take it. You know, I should put quotation marks around it. This is what it means, but I haven't defined what that means exactly. Okay, so conversely, suppose E prime of zero is zero for all proper variations sigma of alpha. So strictly speaking, this notation is ambiguous, right? Because the energy, as I defined it, the energy is associated to a particular variation. So I should have a subscript sigma or something like that. But I don't want to clutter it with too much notation. So the hypothesis is that for any proper variation, the derivative of the energy at time zero is zero. We want to show that alpha has to be a geodesic. Okay. So uh, let um, rho from zero to A to the reals be a, um, I have piecewise smooth in my notes, but you can even do this with smooth, piecewise smooth function um, such that rho of T is positive for all T in the open intervals and rho of TK is zero for all k from one up to n. You can certainly find such a function. It's going to look, you know, it's going to look something like that. A bunch of bumps. This is zero to a. It's going to vanish at all the at all the t's. And let's take. I don't want to erase that formula on the right. So let's go back to the other side, and let's choose a particular vector field along alpha, which is the following. Um, let V of T be rho of T times DT alpha prime. Okay, so what does this mean? The, the uh, acceleration of alpha, this only makes sense at uh, points where alpha is smooth. So this is only, in, in the open intervals, tk minus one to tk, this is a well-defined uh, smooth vector field along the restriction of alpha to this open interval. But this guy vanishes at tk. So what we're saying is that this, uh, this v is defined to be um, you know, exactly this on the open intervals and is defined to be zero on, uh, on the other parts. So then v, is a continuous uh, piecewise smooth, I guess I'm being redundant, piecewise smooth implies continuous vector field along alpha. Um, and let's let sigma be, um, the, be a variation inducing V. We proved last lecture that for any vector field, a piecewise smooth vector field along the curve, you can find a variation for which this is the variational vector field. And notice that V at zero equals V at A equals zero, right? Because uh, rho vanishes at, at the two endpoints. So this variation is proper, right? This is, if this is the sigma we got from the theorem last time, right? If the vector field vanishes at the endpoints, then um, the variation is proper. I wanna keep this on the board. So the hypothesis then is that E prime at time zero, e, e prime at zero is gonna be zero. But let's look at what we get for this particular vector field. We're gonna have um, this vector field vanishes at all the TKs. So V of TK equals zero for all K uh, and V at zero and V at A equals zero. Right? This is included in there anyway, because, because the first and last one are zero and A. So all of these terms go away for this vector field. And what we are left with is minus the integral from zero to A, rho of T, dt alpha prime, dt alpha prime, 
PT. Okay, so now um, this function is non-negative. It's continuous and non-negative, and the integral is zero. Therefore, rho of t times dt alpha prime squared is zero on zero to a. Now, again, I'm being sloppy, right? Because this function is not defined at t equals tk, but this one is, and, and this, this combination is a zero function. Um, so for t in tk minus one to tk, the open interval, this is positive, we get dt alpha prime equals zero. So this, this um, curve alpha, when you restrict it to any of the open intervals, it satisfies the geodesic equation. So alpha restricted to tk minus one, tk is a geodesic for all k equals one up to n. We still want to show that, that they, they glue together in a C1 way to give you actually a smooth geodesic. So let's see what happens at the TK. At each TK, we have to use the full power of the hypothesis that this derivative E prime of zero is zero for any proper variation. Okay, so we're going to choose another variation now. Choose, construct, a piecewise smooth vector field. I'm going to call it W just so we don't get confused with the previous one along alpha, such that, first of all, we want it to vanish at the two endpoints. And uh, W at TK is equal to alpha prime TK plus minus alpha prime. TK minus. So I'm not going to go through the details of how to do this, but it's fairly clear that uh, this can be done. I can I can use cutoff functions, whatever uh, bump functions, to build uh, a vector field which vanishes at the two endpoints and has these va fixed values at the TKs. And this one again, since it vanishes at the endpoints, is induced by a proper variation. So W is the vector field of a proper variation of alpha. And for this, for this variation, we have, again, E prime is zero at S equals zero. So let's plug this one in and see. Again, it's a proper variation. Now, now V is W, so these are gonna go away. We've already shown that this term is zero because that function is well-defined on all the open intervals. It's the zero function. So this inner product is not defined at the TKs, but it's zero everywhere else. And by continuity, that doesn't change the integral. This integral is zero. So this is zero uh, and these are zero. And the way we've chosen our W is exactly gonna give us um, minus the sum from K equals one up to N minus one alpha prime of TK plus minus alpha prime of TK minus norm squared. And again, this is a sum of squares. This implies alpha prime TK plus equals alpha prime TK minus for all K up to N minus one. So there is no jumps. So alpha is in fact in C1 of zero A that the velocity is continuous. Um, and what do we know? I don't want to erase this again. So there's one more thing to say. Um, we know that dt alpha prime is smooth on tk minus one tk. Um, sorry. Uh, okay. So what am I saying here? Alpha prime is a, is a piecewise smooth vector field, right? Uh, is a piecewise smooth curve. Alpha, alpha is a piecewise smooth curve. That means alpha prime, the velocity vector field is a piecewise smooth vector field. So there's some extension of alpha to an open interval containing this closed bounded interval, which is a smooth curve. 
which restricts to this one here. Okay, and of course that extension is not the same as the extension on the next interval or on the previous interval. They don't they don't match. They don't pair up. But there is some smooth curve defined on an open interval containing this, which restricts to alpha. And so I can define dt alpha prime uh, from that. Um, and, it's, and it's a smooth vector field, except that the one I get from the previous one doesn't necessarily patch up with this, right? It, it can have jumps, but it's still, um, there's only a finite number of points that I'm throwing out of the integral didn't affect anything. But we also know that dt alpha prime is zero on the open interval. That's what we proved at the beginning, okay? So therefore, it follows that dt alpha prime is zero that once we know that alpha prime is actually continuous, this is zero on the whole zero A, since alpha prime is continuous. Um, in other words, the, the curve is, is actually a smooth curve. It, it's, a, it's a C1 curve. Alpha prime is continuous. Um, and therefore, um, by the uniqueness of the OD theorem, we get that alpha is in C infinity because the geodesic equation has a, has a unique solution and it's C infinity. Okay, so this is a, so this is a, a curve which, ha, which satisfies the, the initial conditions for the geodesic equation um, and it's at least uh, C1. So the solution is gonna be C infinity. Um, okay, so that's, so alpha, is a geodesic. Okay, so to summarize, the, the proposition is long gone. It says that um, a curve alpha, piecewise smooth curve alpha is critical with respect to all proper variations, if and only if it's a geodesic, right? So we characterize geodesics as the, uh, in what I said here as critical points with respect to the first variation formula that means, uh, the, velo the, the, velo the, the derivative at s equals zero of any proper variation vanishes. Okay. So once we've taken one derivative, we might as well take two derivatives, which is what we're going to do next. So usually in calculus, right, you, want, you, you look at critical points of something, that's the places where the derivative is zero. And then you want to know what kind of critical points are they? Are they local maxima or local minima? So you study the second derivative. And you usually only look at the second derivative at a place where the first derivative is already zero. So let's compute uh, the second derivative e double prime of zero. Um, Let me say the second derivative of the energy uh, ES at S equals zero for a variation for which um, E prime, and let me not say that, uh, at S equals zero for a variation of a geodesic. So um, E prime of zero equals zero for all proper variations. But I'm just gonna look at one particular variation and I'm not gonna assume it's, it's proper, but, but the, the goal, I mean, the idea is that the, the previous result told us that the, the, the places that it's interesting to study the second derivative of the energy, the, the curves for which it's interesting to study the second derivative of the energy are the geodesics. Okay, so here's the proposition. And this is, I'm gonna call this V2, second variation of energy for a geodesic. Okay, so let gamma be a geodesic. So now it satisfies the, uh, the geodesic equation and it doesn't have any jumps in its velocity. It's smooth. 
let sigma from zero to A to M uh, be, I, first I'll do it for a proper variation and then we'll see the extra terms when it's not proper. Proper variation of gamma um, and let E be the energy of this variation. So what we want is E double prime at S equals zero. Then E double prime at zero is minus the integral from zero to A, V of T, let me not put the of T's, V, V double prime plus R of V gamma prime, gamma prime DT. And hopefully you'll recognize this as being the, this vanishing is the Jacobi equation, is the Jacobi equation minus the sum from k equals one up to n minus one, v at tk, inner product with um, v prime at tk plus minus v prime at tk minus. Inner so where- Could where you ask v, the camera guy to move? Oh, the camera, Sydney, can you move the camera? Where, V is the variational field of sigma. V prime as usual is dt v, v double prime is dt squared v, and uh, v prime at tk plus minus is the limit as t goes to tk plus minus of v prime of t. Remember, v, pri v, was, v was continuous but V prime does not have to be continuous. V prime can have jumps. And that's what confused me last class because I was thinking ahead to the second variation formula. Okay, so, um, so that's the, uh, and R is the curvature, the curvature, All right? And you should recognize this thing, as I said, this is the thing that vanishes for a Jacobi field. So you can see that Jacobi fields are related to the second variation of energy. Okay, in fact, I mean, I might as well just say it now without writing it down. This formula tells you that if you had a smooth, Jacobi fields are smooth, right? So if you had a Jacobi field, it's smooth. So there's no jumps in anything and this vanishes. So the second derivative at time zero is zero in, for a variation that's induced by a Jacobi field. Right? And you think about, remember Jacobi fields were only defined on geodesics, right? Think about calculus, what does it tell you the first derivative is zero. It could be a local max or a local min, or it could, could be neither, right? Jacobi fields are exactly those directions you can move in the space of all variations of your geodesic where the second derivative doesn't change infinitesimally. Okay. So, so um, infinitesimally, the energy is, is uh, not changing to, high, to leading order uh, along a Jacobi field, along a variation induced by a Jacobi field. Okay, so let's, let's prove this and look how beautifully this worked out. I have the formula here for the first derivative. This gives um, E prime of S. And so let's take D by DS of that. So we're gonna differentiate this with respect to S um, and we're going to have, again, by metric compatibility, we'll have a term where I differentiate this, a term where I differentiate this, and, and similarly here, we'll have two terms. So we're going to get four terms, and we're going to have to show that a bunch of them are zero. So we get E double prime of S. First, I'm going to have did I write the integral first? I wrote, I'm going to put the integral first, which is second there, but anyway. Um, ds of d sigma ds 
dt d sigma dt minus zero to a d sigma ds ds dt d sigma dt and then plus the sum from k equals one that that should have been a big n right um, k equals one up to n of ds d sigma ds d sigma dt from tk minus one to tk plus the sum from k equals one up to n d sigma ds inner product ds d sigma dt from tk minus one to tk. Okay, so let's look at each of these four terms separately. So now we want to let s equal zero, right? Because we only care about the second derivative at time zero. So remember, um, d sigma ds at s equals zero is v. Uh, sigma at s equals zero is gamma. And, um, and therefore, dt. Let's see. Uh, d sigma dt at s equals zero is dt uh, gamma, which is just gamma prime, and dt of d sigma dt at s equals zero is dt gamma prime, which is zero because gamma is a geodesic. Okay. So uh, that means this first term. When I set s equal to zero, I don't know what this is, but I know this will be zero. This equals zero at, at s equals zero because it's a geodesic. Okay, so the first term vanishes at s equals zero. I claim that the third term also vanishes. So consider the third term what is ds d sigma ds at s comma tk well i'm only differentiating with respect to s so i can fix t uh, to be to be constant this depends only on s dot tk Right, differentiating with respect to s, I can I can set t to what it's going to be, um, and is smooth in s. In s, and sigma is continuous in t. Um, so this d s d sigma d s is um, is continuous in t. Um, from the left or right, right? It's continuous in T. This is exactly how I explained on Piazza yesterday or, or the day before that D sigma DS, which is V, right, is, 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 um, is continuous in T because you're only differentiating in the S direction and, the, and by definition of a, a variation, sigma is smooth in the S direction and it's continuous in T. So that means this third term, um, And uh, d sigma dt is is uh, is gamma prime, right? In in the original first variation, this could have had jumps, but now we're looking at a geodesic, so gamma prime doesn't have any jumps. So this becomes gamma prime at t equals zero. This becomes uh, at uh, s equals zero. This becomes ds d sigma ds at s equals zero. Whatever this is, it's a continuous vector field in t. It's a vector field along gamma, which is continuous in t. And therefore, this vanishes. So the third term vanishes. At s equals 0. Um, 
we still have the second and fourth terms. I want it. Yep. Question. Yeah. What it is, or I haven't done anything with the fourth term yet. I haven't here. This is E double prime at S. I haven't put S equals zero yet. Yeah. Which one, this guy? Um, no, but for any, for any, if you differentiate with respect to S, it's smooth in the S direction, right? This, this function sigma depends on S and T. It's piecewise smooth in T, but continuous, and it's smooth in S, right? So this guy, you, you can compute this, uh, I want to, and then I want to differentiate with respect to S, right? So when I differentiate with respect to S, uh, I can I can already put the value of T that I want in. So I can do d sigma dt at some T, right? So I have to first do d sigma dt and then put in whatever T I want, and then I can take ds of that, and it's smooth, right? It, it's continuous in T, yes. That's exactly what I was saying here too and what caused confusion last time. So So we know that the first and the, and the, and the third terms are zero. This is what we want to prove. So I'd rather not erase it, but I could erase that guy now. We don't need that one anymore. So, oh, sorry. The third term is not zero. Um, because there's one bit that doesn't cancel, right? Um, these things, it's not zero, but, but the only thing that's left over is the, is the top one when k equals n and the bottom one when k equals one. So we don't, um, most of the third term cancels and we're left with, Let me see what the sign is. It's a plus. So we get uh, ds, d sigma ds at zero um, a inner product alpha prime at a minus ds, d sigma ds at zero, zero inner product alpha prime of zero. That's right. So that's the, this is the third term. Okay. That's the general formula for the third term, but I, I knew why I was jumping the gun. Uh, our variation is proper. The statement I gave of the proposition is for proper variations. And you'll see that when it's not proper, we're going to have this extra term. This is going to vanish. So. Uh, sigma of S zero is alpha of zero for all S and sigma of S A is alpha of A for all S. And that implies that D S, D sigma D S is zero at zero T is zero at T equals zero and T equals A. Because I'm only differentiating with respect to S. So I can put T equals zero, T equals A right away and it's independent of S. Okay, so the third term vanishes for proper variations. Okay. Um, now let's look at the fourth term. Um, by the symmetry lemma, We get that the fourth term is the sum from k equals one up to n. Let's go back and look at the fourth term. I have a, a ds on a d sigma dt. I can swap the t and the s there. So I'm going to get d sigma ds 
ds of d sigma dt from tk minus one to tk. Um, um, and then at s equals zero, this is going to be the sum from k equals one up to n. This is v at t. Uh, um, well, let me just write v. d sigma ds is v when, when s equals zero. And this is, I wrote the right, I wrote the same thing twice. I wanted to swap the t and the s, sorry, t s, right? Now I'm doing a t derivative so I can set s equal to zero. This is dtv from tk minus one to tk. And that's the sum from k equals one up to n of v of tk minus uh, inner product v prime of t uh, k minus the sum from k equals one up to n v at tk minus one v prime at tk minus one and i can rewrite that we still have the second term let's keep that And that's equal to, um, let's look at what we get here. I can, re I can write this. So when I have the top one, I'll have a V at uh, A times V prime at A. And the, the bottom one, I'll have a V of zero times V prime of zero. So V A, V prime A minus V zero, V prime zero. And what's left over, I can group together minus the sum from k equals one up to n minus one of v of tk v prime of tk plus minus v prime of tk minus. Let's just make sure that makes sense. So here in this, in this sum, I'm going to get, uh, well, it's easier to see it here. So I'm going to get the plus sign is going to be coming in from the left. And the minus sign is going to sorry is going to be coming in from the left, and the minus sign is going to be coming in for the right from the right, uh, and that's what I have here: minus sign from the right and plus sign from the left. So this is the um, fourth term, and again we see that the first two parts vanish for a proper variation. This is zero for a proper variation. So we only get the sum. And you can see that's this term here. And now we just need uh, the second term and we'll be done. And it's still here. Finally, the second term is minus zero to a d sigma ds ds dt d sigma dt dt. And I'm going to write this. Remember our formula for commuting covariant differentiation along the curve, along a parametrized surface. This is dt ds of d sigma dt plus uh, r of d sigma ds d sigma dt d sigma dt. And, dt. and then at s equals zero, oh, I can also use uh, the symmetry lemma again, and I can write this as dt d sigma ds by the symmetry lemma. So at s equals zero, this becomes, uh, this becomes, uh, sorry, that was an s. I don't know why I wrote t, it's an s. This becomes v, and this becomes v, so I get v double prime plus r, this becomes v, and this becomes gamma prime dt. So this is the second term. And then putting them all together then, 
we showed that the first term was zero. We showed that the third term is this, uh, which vanishes for a proper variation. This, the fourth term is this guy, but the orange part vanishes for proper variation. So we just have this sum. And then the second term is this. So this is the, this is the second term. And this is what was left of the uh, fourth term. Okay, so we've shown Um, let's call it double star, which is this one. Okay. So before we move on from the second variation formula, I want to um, write out the more general one when the variation is not proper, which we basically also still have on the board, and then uh, re rearrange that one because we're going to need an alternate version of it when we prove the Morse index theorem in a few weeks. So remark, if the variation sigma is not proper, we've shown that um, E double prime at s equals zero. So I still have this term. I still have this term. D of tk, d prime of tk plus minus b prime of tk minus. And what else do I have? I also have these two terms, um, which got, were, were zero in the proper case. So then I'm gonna have to erase this now. Plus uh, ds, d sigma ds at uh, zero a, let me, uh, yeah, gamma prime, alpha, uh, I called it alpha here, I don't know why. Gamma prime at A minus ds, d sigma ds at zero, zero, inner product gamma prime of zero. That was these guys. And then the only other ones we had were these that dropped out when, when it was proper. So plus uh, V of A, V prime at A minus V at zero, V prime at zero, okay? So this is the second variation formula at a geodesic without assuming a proper variation. So this is the second variation formula for a geodesic with respect to an arbitrary, not necessarily proper variation. And what I wanna do is I wanna rewrite this again by integration by parts. And you'll see that in fact, a lot of these ugly terms um, can be grouped together in, a, in an in a nice expression. And that's gonna define what's called the index form. Okay. Um, all right, let's, let's do that. So we're gonna, we'll rewrite, call this V2, tilde, let's rewrite V2 tilde in an alternate form, which will be useful when we prove the Morse index theorem. And I think that's chapter 11. 
11, I think. It's 10 or 11 or 12, I think it's 11. It's coming in a few weeks. So this is how we're gonna do it. So on each TK minus one to TK, these open intervals where uh, V is smooth, remember V was piecewise smooth. So on these open intervals, it's smooth. Uh, we can write V by DT of the inner product of V with itself is Oh, sorry, V with V prime. Again, by, by metric compatibility, that's equal to V prime, V prime plus V, V double prime. Okay, so hence, um, zero to A, V, V double prime DT, I'm gonna rewrite this term. Uh, I'm gonna break this integral into two terms and the first term up to the minus sign is the integral of inner product of v with v double prime. So this one is the sum from k equals one up to n of the integral from tk minus one to tk v with v double prime. And I can write that as the sum from k equals one up to n of tk minus one to tk. I'm gonna rewrite this. I'm gonna use this to solve for that. So I get d by dt of v, v prime minus v prime v prime dt. And then um, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is gonna be the sum from k equals one up to n of, um, I'm integrating a derivative. So this will be v, uh, v prime at, tk to tk minus one um, minus, and now this one, I'm not going to, I'm just gonna add up all these integrals. This is zero to a v prime v prime. Okay, so this first term, um, I can basically integrate by parts. I wanna move this derivative to the left and get a minus sign, but I have to pick up this term because of this discontinuities in, in v prime, okay? But let's see exactly what this term is. It's going to be exactly canceled by all these other terms. Um, so zero to a v v double prime v t is going to be. I'm going to I'm going to take this sum. I'm going to write out the uh, term when k equals n, the, the top one, that's gonna be v of uh, a times inner product v prime of a, the bottom one is gonna be the other guy. So v of a, v prime of a minus v of zero, v prime of zero, um, minus the sum from k equals one up to n minus one, v of tk, v prime of, tk plus minus v prime of tk minus. Let's again, make sure I got that right. So in this sum, um, the, uh, the one with the plus sign is coming in from the left and the one with the minus sign is coming in from the right. That's right. Um, and then I also have a minus the integral from zero to a v prime v prime dt. Okay, so I rewrote this thing. And if we look at it, if we look at our, um, our variation formula here, I want, I want minus this, okay? So if I bring this over to the left and bring this one over to the right, I get that uh, minus, I get this first term exactly, uh, yeah minus this guy, minus this one, plus this, plus this, which should be here and here, is exactly equal to that. So in other words, I can replace, I can replace the term coming from here and all of this and all of this by um, plus the integral from zero to A v prime v prime dt. 
So let's rewrite it. We get um, E double prime of zero is zero to A V prime V prime uh, minus this one V R of uh, V gamma prime. I'll put the, it's, it's an inner product, it's symmetric, I'll put it the other way. Gamma prime, gamma prime V dt. That's the integral plus ds, d sigma ds, inner product alpha prime um, at zero a minus ds, d sigma ds, inner product, sorry, gamma, inner product gamma prime at zero, zero. So this is much more compact, and this is not just for proper variations, this is for any variations. This is, these, these terms are the only ones we couldn't deal with. All these other horrible terms involving V prime, we got rid of by basically integrating by parts and getting them in here. Okay. I can erase, I can erase uh, everything else now. Let's call this one V2 alternate. It's the alternate form of the second variation formula where we've integrated by parts. And we're going to use this in a few weeks. We'll use this soon. I'll restate it and I'll remind you that we've proved it. But before we, we leave from this, let me... Um, give a definition and rewrite it uh, uh, once more. So let's define I sub A of V V to be the integral from zero to A inner product of V prime with itself minus R of V gamma prime gamma prime V dt. This is called the index form. We'll see why. The index form of um, the geodesic gamma on zero to A. Okay, so I is for index. A is telling us how far we want to go because when we use this in a few weeks, we're going to want to go to some other time, which might be less than A, right? So we might have some B, which is between zero and A, and we'll have an IB. We'll have an index form for every final time. And strictly speaking, it's IA that's called the index form, right? It's a, it's a quadratic form. So it's associated to a symmetric bilinear form. And you can see that this guy is symmetric. I mean, if you polarize this in V, this is obviously quadratic, right? If I multiply V by a constant, the real constant, it'll come out twice. So it's a quadratic form on the space of uh, piecewise smooth vector fields along gamma. That's an infinite dimensional vector space. Okay, it's a quadratic form on that vector space. And so polarizing it gives you a symmetric bilinear form. Um, and we can do this for any final time A here, as long as the geodesic is defined up to that time. So this is going to be related, um, the, the um, a quadratic form is associated to symmetric bilinear form and the number of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's on an infinite dimensional space, right? So we don't know that it can be orthogonally diagonalized or anything like that. Uh, there's no spectral theorem we can appeal to because it's not finite dimensional. But nevertheless, we can look for eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are still gonna be real. That, that proof that the eigenvalues of a symmetric bilinear form are real, if they exist, uh, it doesn't need finite dimensions. Okay, but the the um, eigenspaces with with negative eigenvalue are going to be important. So later, the eigenspaces of um, I don't want to call them maybe eigenspaces. The the subspaces 
because this is not an operator, it's a bilinear form. The subspaces of um, the space of uh, piecewise smooth, let me call them subspaces. Uh, I don't know what to call them. K of the spaces of piecewise smooth vector fields along gamma uh, on which I alpha is negative definite will be important. For the Morse index theorem. In fact, what we'll prove is that uh, there is a finite dimensional, maximal, finite dimensional subspace on which the index form is negative definite. And then the rest of the space is infinite dimensional, but on that, and the rest of the space, it's positive semi definite. Okay, so it only actually has. Uh, negative definite subspaces on a fine, only uh, can only have a, a maximum of positive, uh, a finite dimensional negative definite subspace. Um, and so what we've shown is, we've shown that for any uh, variation, sigma of the geodesic gamma, not necessarily proper, We have that the second derivative of the energy at s equals zero is the index form. That's exactly this guy plus these two annoying terms. Okay. Plus ds d sigma uh, ds alpha prime gamma prime at zero a minus ds d sigma yes gamma prime at zero, zero. So I'm being a little sloppy here, right? Strictly speaking, because I'm putting an S and a T, I should be writing this as d sigma dt, right? Because this thing only eats a time, not an S, but you know what I mean here. Uh, and these vanish if the variation is proper. So we've compressed all the information into these two annoying terms, which are not there for proper variations. And this integral, which is basically obtained by integrating by parts the Jacobi equation inner product with V. Okay, so there's no point in me starting a theorem with two minutes to go, but let me just remind you what we're gonna do on Monday. We've now gone through the first two thirds of chapter nine, and we're gonna finish it on Monday. And what we're going to do is apply this second variation formula to prove two uh, global results. So next time, we'll use V2 to prove um, the Bonnet Myers theorem which says that if M G is complete and the Ricci tensor of M is greater than or equal to um, some constant times the metric where this is positive. So strictly positive Ricci, then M is compact. So a complete Riemannian manifold with strictly positive Ricci has to be compact and moreover, we'll get a quantitative estimate in terms of C for the diameter of the manifold. And what is the diameter? It's the diameter as a metric space. So the diameter of the manifold is the supremum over all P and Q and M of the distance from P to Q, okay? In general, this doesn't have to be finite, but for a compact manifold, it's finite, okay? Because it, it's a compact manifold is, is a, a compact metric space is bounded. So, so this, is, this is 
finite. Okay, um, and then there's also the Singe Weinstein theorem, which I stated last time. I won't state again. This is another theorem where you assume completeness and some topological assumptions and some curvature assumptions, and then you get some other topological consequences. Okay, so it's another local to global result. In other words, it, this is a bit false, a bit um, inaccurate, right? You need to assume some global conditions and then a local condition and you conclude another global condition. So that's the plan for Monday. We'll, we'll do all of that on Monday, it won't take that long. And there won't be as many horrendous long derivations of formulas as there was today. Um, then we're gonna move on next Wednesday to the Rauch comparison theorem, which is another application of the second variation formula. Right? We're gonna get a lot of mileage out of that thing. Okay, uh, that's it, right? You can, do, you can do the whole assignment three. It's not due till a week from Friday or this, a week from Friday. I, I, yeah, I made it due too, too long from now, but I'm not gonna change anything. I haven't started marking the second one anyway, so it's in my best interest not to change. I mean, if I made a, if I changed the due date to make it earlier than original, I would get skewered in the evaluations, right? So it's due on the 11th. Okay, any questions? <laughs>